With no further delays, I'd like to get to our speaker this evening, uh, Dr. Tom Poole. Uh, was born and raised in Maine, also known as the Pine Tree State. And so he's gone from one forested coast to the other forested coast. Uh, this is where he developed his fascination with intertidal ecology and formed an avid interest in gulls. And after obtaining his undergraduate degree in Vermont, he went to, on to the University of New Hampshire for his master's, where he studied, yes, you guessed it, gulls. And as he moved forward, he paused for a few years at the uh, University of Kansas for his PhD, this time focusing on Washington coast populations of gulls. So fast forward to the present. Since 2001, Tom has been a research biologist for NOAA Fisheries at the Northwest Fisheries Science Center in Seattle. He works primarily on seabird fishery interactions, and as you will soon learn, conducts field studies of predation by Caspian terns and others on juvenile, juvenile salmonids of the Columbia River and Salish Sea. Tom's work and influence flow beyond our turns and cormorants. His other areas of activity and expertise lie in reduction and mitigation of seabird bycatch of albatrosses and other seabirds. In addition, he also monitors rhinoceros, auklet, and tufted, tufted puffin diet and productivity in our region. He does this by documenting fish prey conditions and contaminant levels. Tom also shoulders responsibility as the seabird team leader for the NOAA Fisheries California Current Integrated Ecosystem Assessment. That is a mouthful. Tom, you're a very busy man. We thank you so much for making time to share with us this evening. And so Elaine, let's turn the presentation over to Tom. All right, let me share my screen. Put it in slideshow mode, swap. Hopefully now you can see the slideshow. Am I right? Perfect. Okay. <laughs> and it's always good to check. It takes about four steps. So um, pardon my squeaky chair. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for the invitation to uh, speak. Um, this is a, a newly created talk for me that stems from uh, adventures in the last couple of years chasing Caspian terns around part of Puget Sound, trying to figure out where they're going, what they're doing. Um, and uh, <clears throat> it relies on contributions from uh, uh, many colleagues whose contributions I want to acknowledge, and, and you will see some of them uh, throughout the talk. And without their efforts, the, this piecing together of decades of information and insights uh, wouldn't be possible. And they deserve much of the credit. And uh, any misstatements or errors um, are solely mine, not theirs. <clears throat> so uh, Caspian terns, as Elaine said, the world's largest tern, display a number of uh, life history, behavioral, and ecological traits that are generally advantageous and lead to their success, such that failure in a single year can be countered by success in any number of subsequent years. However, some of these traits can expose them to multiple factors, uh, proverbial rocks and hard places that can negatively affect individual birds, uh, partial or whole colonies, and perhaps the status of the entire West Coast Caspian turn population. <clears throat> so a rock and a hard place is a modern colloquialism which has its origins in Greek mythology. Uh, so my, <clears throat> I wanted to show this uh, so that my, um, small liberal arts college professors would be proud of me. In Homer's Odyssey, Odysseus is caught between uh, Scylla and Charybdis, two immortal and irresistible monsters. Uh, Scylla had 12 feet and six heads on long snaky necks and from her lair in a cave, she devoured whatever ventured within reach, including six of Odysseus's companions. Charybdis, personified as a whirlpool, drank down and belched forth the waters three times a day. So being caught between two monsters was being caught between two bad situations or challenging factors. And that's what gave me, as I began looking around for the turns and figuring out what has been they've been dealing with in the last few years, that, that sort of came to mind. And so in recent years, uh, Caspian turns in the Salish Sea, who, uh, for the moment I have dubbed Odysseus Caspia, uh, for this story, have suffered a series of catastrophic events at their largest colonies, multiple rocks and hard places that have challenged their ability to survive and thrive in this region. 
in 2021, an unprecedented heat wave, uh, a heat dome it was called, was responsible for substantial chick mortality uh, on a rooftop colony in South Seattle, uh, which was one of the uh, only known colonies at that time outside of the Columbia River, or at least in the Salish Sea. And in 2022, uh, predator disturbance led the birds to abandon this rooftop colony during egg laying. They moved to another rooftop location along the Seattle waterfront where their second egg laying attempts were also unsuccessful. And predator disturbance uh, at an island colony led to near breeding failure um, at the second location that was uh, being used in 2022. And then in 2023, as many of you may know, a highly pathogenic avian flu made an appearance in the Pacific Northwest, wiping out more than half the adults at a Caspian Turn colony in Port Townsend Bay and the Eastern Strait of Juan de Fuca. So as I mentioned, in the face of these unprecedented challenges, uh, Caspian Turns display a number of traits that are generally advantageous. Uh, like many seabirds, Caspian Turns are relatively long lived. Uh, banding studies have documented uh, an individual living 26 years, but birds are more likely to live about 10 to 15 years. Uh, they are relatively late maturing, they, uh, breeding at age five or six years. They have low fecundity, generally laying eggs, uh, generally laying about uh, one to three eggs per breeding attempt. Uh, both parents feed the chicks before they fledge, uh, bringing single fish back to the colony uh, multiple times per day. And they have extended uh, post-fledging parental care where parents may continue to feed young for several months after they fledge. Again, like most seabirds, they are colonial breeders, generally nesting in dense colonies on islands and hard to reach places, um, <clears throat> island-like areas, for example, rooftops, uh, that can have a sight line to the water. They like to have a sight line to the water. And this colonial breeding habit can confer safety in numbers, but can also attract a variety of avian and mammalian predators uh, and facilitate disease transmission. Uh, they display variable phylopatry or fidelity to their breeding colonies. It ranges from very strong, uh, in some cases, uh, to the point of ignoring risks associated with particular locations, uh, to very weak uh, and changeable from year to year, such that it seems like they'll try different colonies that they may have known about in the past every single year and move around and be very sort of a gypsy kind of, uh, <clears throat> not a strategy, but a lifestyle. Um, they display fairly strict habitat requirements as they prefer to nest on bare or sparsely vegetated sand. So colony sites are frequently situated where uh, sand uh, buildup and erosion prevent vegetation encroachment, but such areas can be washed away during winter storm tides and this has factored into uh, the demise of colonies in uh, some embayments on the outer coast, in Willapa Bay and, and Grays Harbor, and also in the Potholes Reservoir, which has its water level uh, regulated. And so it comes up and it can uh, inundate uh, nests if they are too close to the water. Uh, also, uh, Caspian Turn colonies that establish on uh, dredged material are usually constrained, uh, such as down in the Columbia River. Um, inevitably, there's encroaching vegetation that happens within a few years, um, such as happened on East Sand Island, um, and that required uh, annual maintenance when they were encouraging the birds uh, to nest there. So any story of Caspian Terns in the Salish Sea uh, would be incomplete without some history of the entire Pacific flyway of Caspian Terns. Um, and the history of the, of the breeding population along the West Coast over the last century has been one of rapid expansion from inland sites uh, to coastal and increasingly large colonies. Uh, early in the 20th century, a uh, population of Caspian Terns uh, nested primarily in colonies at inland lakes and marshes by the mid 20th century. The breeding colonies uh, were mostly at inland lakes and reservoirs still with a few small colonies on coastal bays and estuaries, um, uh, such as uh, San Francisco Bay, and then uh, uh, then expanded to other uh, small embayments on the, on the coast. 
and many of the Indian colonies were then in decline and of con conservation concern. And then during the latter half of the 20th century, uh, uh, the, the shift from the inland lakes and reservoirs to coastal sites um, included um, into the uh, Columbia uh, River estuary. Um, the population increased about 70% uh, from 1960 to 1980. Um, and then uh, around 1980, the largest colonies uh, were in Grays Harbor and San Francisco Bay. So this, um, the map shows sort of current and historical without distinguishing between the two, but it gives you an idea of how they um, all up and down the coast, but they have moved uh, in dominance, sort of the center of gravity of these colonies has changed from uh, uh, over time. So artificially enlarged islands near the mouth of the Columbia River created by the US Army Corps of Engineers dredging the river had the inadvertent consequence of creating um, nesting conditions that made it possible for Caspian terns to nest there in abundance. And their numbers breeding there exploded from zero uh, um, around uh, 1979 to almost 9,000 pairs by 2000. Uh, unfortunately, this prime location was also a corridor for juvenile salmonids out migrating from the entire Columbia River Basin um, to the sea. And studies of Caspian tern diet revealed that they, along with double crested cormorants that also uh, flocked to these two islands to breed, uh, were consuming millions of juvenile salmon and steelhead every year. So, this conservation conundrum uh, protected birds species consuming threatened and endangered salmon led to a series of management actions to reduce this avian predation. And one of the first actions conducted around, um, uh, well, more than 20 years ago, uh, involved uh, relocating the main Caspian tern colony from Rice Island at river kilometer 34 to East Sand Island at river kilometer eight. So down river, which was much closer to the Columbia River mouth. And so the result of the colony relocation closer to marine waters was a dramatic increase in the consumption of marine forage fishes available there. Uh, and so, uh, and, sorry, including uh, anchovy, herring, smelt, and sand lance. And it reduced the consumption of Pacific herring. Can you see uh, if I use the laser pointer or no? I'm, I'm using it right yes. now. Yep. You can. Okay. I wasn't sure. Yeah. But, all right. Thank you. <laughs> so in addition to moving the main Caspian tern colony from Rice Island to East Sand Island to re reduce this consumption of, of juvenile salmonids, the management plan also wanted to squeeze the size of that colony down from 9,400 breeding pairs to about 3,000 breeding pairs by reducing the habitat. Like I said, they're very strict habitat requirements. So uh, you can see here on the on the on the uh, picture on the left, uh, they gradually reduce the size of this colony. This this is taken in the later years, so they they keep the very center of the colony that they want to be available, or you know, an acre or two. I think it ends up being um, about an acre um, as bare sand, uh, with uh, being able to see the uh, the water, and they let the vegetation grow around it. Um, <clears throat> uh, because that discourages term predation. Um, they also uh, wanted to prevent terns from nesting elsewhere in the estuary, uh, including Rice Island, where they had been before. So they um, encouraged the growth of vegetation there. And they created a series of alternative tern nesting habitats, uh, islands outside the Columbia River Basin, and used social attraction, um, which is uh, these decoys, um, and recordings of, uh, they put out these sort of, you know, outdoor speakers that would 24 seven play recordings of a Caspian tern colony to draw the Caspian terns there to breed. Um, it's called, uh, using, uh, it's called social attraction, the combination of these uh, techniques. And in fact, I have here, I can't see on my screen, but these are a couple of the, uh, Caspian tern, um, um, decoys that we used um, 
when I was uh, doing some work in the Oculus Reservoir in Eastern Washington. So, uh, and I tried to embed a Caspian turn call. You'll all have to imagine it or go, uh, or go in your own time <laughs> to, um, uh, to find it online. Um, and so uh, this management did have the desired effect. It redistributed the Caspian turns from the Columbia River estuary, this sort of oversized colony to a series of smaller colonies that um, um, where they could be, um, where they were definitely not uh, eating uh, juvenile salmonids. So the East Sand Island uh, colony was, uh, went uh, very much in the negative uh, direction in terms of, so it was reduced. Crescent Island and Goose Island, which are uh, interior uh, uh, island uh, colonies in or near the Columbia River, where they also were eating a lot of salmon, were also, they were discouraged from there and they were encouraged to go to these uh, uh, lakes, lake uh, habitats, islands that had been created mostly in Oregon, but also in uh, San Francisco Bay. And so uh, this was considered um, a success and a bit of redistrib redistributing turns uh, back to their smaller sort of inland colonies where they had been before, where they actually started out before they had come uh, to dominate on the coast. So meanwhile, over the last 40 years in the Salish Sea, Caspian Turn colonies have, have winked on and off at various locations with no one place ever becoming established for very long. Like I said, some of that is, uh, uh, and some of these turns have clearly tried out some of these locations at different times. So this meant while many locations were used by Caspian turns, the center of gravity in the Salish Sea kind of depended on what year you were interested in looking at them. And so I put together kind of a series of, of slides to, to show you how that has transpired since basically around 1980. So in 1980, um, the Caspian Turn colonies in Washington were basically confined to the outer coast, particularly Grace Harbor. So this is in terms of the entire state of Washington. So they, were, um, they weren't on inland colonies, they had moved uh, to the coast and they were in Grace Harbor. It was about 2000 pairs, something like that, on several islands in Grace Harbor. In uh, 1995, uh, Caspian terns were documented breeding in the Salish Sea with about 125 pairs nesting in Padilla Bay, which is uh, up here, and uh, about 20 pairs on Jetty Island in Everett. From 1999 to 2000, about 100 pairs nested in Commencement Bay, primarily in the Asarco EPA Superfund site, um, uh, including in 2001, there was an experimental barge study trying to see if perhaps that was a way that you could get um, uh, turns, uh, you could create habitat for turns on barges um, in the Salish Sea. From 2003 to 2007, uh, about 200 to 1,100 pairs nested on Dungeness Spit here, and about 130 to 500 pairs nested on three buildings at the near the Breverton Naval Base. So you can see how they're sort of they're jumping around; uh, they're not staying in one place for very long. So this continues from 2010 to 2011. Uh, about 1,500 pairs uh, nested in Bellingham Bay. Uh, 420 pairs uh, nested in Padilla Bay. Uh, oop, I lost my place. Oh, there it is. Uh, 129 pairs nested on the Kimberly Clark building uh, on the Everett waterfront. Uh, 60 pair, pairs nested um, at uh, uh, Pier 90 on the Seattle waterfront and about 42 pairs nested on Dungeon to Spit. So there's, there's five or six colonies uh, during this time, but, but again, they're sort of smaller. Um, in 2015, 900 pairs nested on the Kimberly Clark property on the Everett waterfront and 500 pairs 
uh, nested on Rat Island in Port Townsend Bay. So this is the first time they had appeared, uh, at, they were documented, I should say, at Rat Island. Uh, in 2018, uh, 900 pairs nested on the Everett waterfront and about 1,100 pairs nested on the roof of the Port of Seattle uh, Terminal 106 building, situated at the mouth of the Duwamish River, sort of in the South Seattle waterfront. That's the first time they had uh, taken up residence there. From 2019 to 2021, um, that colony grew, and then it was the only colony that people were aware of. Uh, about 1,600 to 3,100 birds or so were documented on the on the port building in 2022. A couple hundred birds nested on that uh, building. Uh, sorry, a couple of thousand birds nested on that building, followed by then they went to the Coast Guard building on the Seattle waterfront. And then there were 300 birds or so on Rat Island. And then in 2023, uh, almost 2,000 birds nested on Rat Island. And then that was the only island that anyone was aware of where terns were nesting. So you can see um, that sort of, you know, as a meta population, all these populations together in the Sailor Sea um, constituted a fair number of birds, but where they were nesting was changing from year to year. So as I mentioned earlier, the last three years have been particularly challenging for Caspian terns. In 2021, the so-called heat dome blanketed the Pacific Northwest with record setting temperatures. Uh, conditions were extremely difficult and sometimes uh, dangerous, particularly for people living outside in some cities. Um, and this was also true as it turns out for some wildlife, including the terns. The only known colony site, like I said, was uh, present on an abandoned warehouse at the Port of Seattle. During this time, they had colonized this warehouse roof um, by taking advantage of dust drifting over from the cement plant, which is on the adjacent property right here. And so the, the dust was sort of drift over and kind of form these small um, little quasi islands made out of cement dust. Um, and the Caspian terns use that as sort of nesting habitat because they just make a shallow depression in the sand uh, for their nest. And this is, uh, this is a drone photograph showing terns using a couple of these little islets. You can kind of see that sort of this accumulated cement dust and that's what these are over here in this picture. Um, but uh, that was of high enough quality that, uh, uh, the, I'm sorry, the pictures were of high enough quality that the uh, port biologists could distinguish. And you could see the um, pictures here of, uh, they could distinguish turns sitting on a nest from turns standing somewhere else so they could get good counts of the number of nests as well as differentiating turns from some gulls that also either hung out on the uh, building or, or nested at the edge of the building as well. So uh, this uh, unprecedented heat wave hit during the critical chick rearing stage for the around 3000 adult birds that were there. Um, and it led to significant uh, chick mortality, hundreds of chicks. Uh, many chicks died from exposure to the brutal conditions on the rooftop or uh, were killed or injured uh, after jumping to the ground below or from wandering into traffic on the nearby state highway, which is running right adjacent to the property. So it was quite, that was a very, quite a tragic year. In 2022, it was a year of disturbances uh, with the two active colonies experiencing a combination of natural and human caused disturbances that wreaked havoc on Caspian turn productivity, again, chick productivity uh, in that year. So during egg laying in June, uh, the Port Warehouse rooftop colony in South Seattle experienced a significant disturbance from a, a nearby uh, nesting um, peregrine falcon. And the colony then in the egg laying phase was abandoned a week later. Uh, much of it had moved to the rooftop. And so this is a, this is the port building. And here they are at the port building. Um, they moved to a U.S. Coast Guard building, which is just up the waterfront here. It was flat and open. So they went up there, laid a bunch of eggs, which ended up, this was 
did not have cement dust sort of quasi sandy uh, habitat. And so the eggs just kind of like rolled around all over the place. Uh, it was, it was definitely not very good habitat. And, and that second nesting attempt failed as well. No, no chicks hatched from either of these uh, locations. So they abandoned them. They moved to a third location up here uh, near the Ballard Locks um, in the ship canal or near, um, near the ship canal that links uh, Lake Union to um, Puget Sound out here. And that, that's this picture here that uh, Kirstie took. And the, uh, the slightly pitched roof in the lateness of the season precluded any more egg laying. It was August by then, but they did roost at this location for a few weeks. Um, and I watched them uh, turn this place into a highway where they just went back and forth down the ship canal out into the near shore waters um, and capture fish and bring them back. And they were still going through um, uh, bring, bringing fish back, back to mates, you know, sort of still trying to do uh, the, the whole, you know, sort of breeding, early breeding uh, process, but it just it was just too late, and so it completed a a season of complete breeding failure, as far as we know, for the Caspian terns uh, throughout the Salish Sea. Um, at Rat Island, there were also multiple disturbances of a different sort. Um, uh, they had super low tides during uh, the weekend of Fourth of July, and allowed people and their dogs, and you can see people here went on to Rat Island. Um, and sort of naively walked around and were probably curious why all the birds were up in the air, completely freaking out. And of course, it was because that they had a colony there. Um, and so they, um, they exposed the eggs and chicks to predation by gulls that are invariably on the same colonies as these terns. And they take advantage of, of, of any kind of disturbances to um, prey on their eggs and chicks. <clears throat> and this, this kind of disturbance is, is pretty common where um, bald eagles also uh, patrol seabird colonies. So eagles will cause a, a disturbance, the terns will fly up. So this, this is very common down in the Columbia River uh, colonies nowadays where they have uh, almost uh, zero uh, breeding success there in the last few years as well. So the birds did try relaying. However, of course, a coyote swam out from a nearby Indian Island and devastated this attempt. And only uh, 20 or so chicks fledged from this colony of, of, of 500 to 1,000 terns. And so, um, yes, a natural disturbance, but uh, maybe an unnatural situation. But And coyotes have been a problem at other natural colonies in the Salish Sea, including at, at Dungeness Spit. So in 2023, uh, as I said, a novel and worrisome threat of highly pathogenic avian flu made its way into the Salish Sea, contributing to the third straight year of rocks and hard places for the region's terns. Um, accounts of the devastation to the Rat Island Caspian Tern Colony by avian flu have been published by colleagues, um, Eric Wagner. Um, I, I have some um, stories here. Um, uh, they've been published as newspaper articles, feature stories, blog posts by uh, Eric Wagner, who, um, who's a science writer and colleague, and Steve Hampton, um, and Kirsty Mule, all people that have been uh, involved in, in some of this work in, in documenting what has been going on the last uh, few years. And I think those links um, will be shared by uh, Elaine. Well, as can happen with communicable diseases in domestic animal and wildlife populations, what began as a, a single dead Caspian tern found near Rat Island suddenly became a dozen. And then upon, you know, a dedicated searching, uh, 15 indivi 50 individuals just within a day. So testing of the birds confirmed the suspected culprit, uh, the avian flu, which has been ravaging domestic poultry operations globally. Um, and during the last couple of years, avian flu has been devastating wild bird populations worldwide, including colonial seabirds. And the flu has uh, jumped to marine mammals in some places uh, where their dense colonies and rookeries share locations. And so it, it has been ravaging uh, some colonies uh, on multiple continents all over the world. Well, by the end of the season in 2023, avian flu had wiped out more than 
half of the almost 2,000 adults nesting at uh, Rat Island. And WDFW also documented over 500 dead chicks. So this, this shows the sort of the, the number of dead birds, the sort of the, est the estimated number of, of um, birds on the island. Um, and then the number of dead birds that, that were found. And then at least for the adults, sort of the proportion of mortality of this, of this event on this island, which, like I said, is the only known um, Caspian Tern breeding location in the Salish Sea in 2023. So more than half of the adult birds died. Um, and uh, curiously, um, for the glaucous wing gulls, um, a much smaller number of birds died proportionally out of the total number of birds on the colony, although chicks did die as well. Um, so, uh, and so of these nesting gulls, and here they're called glaucous wing gull hybrids. Um, that's a long story for another time, um, but uh, only about 3% of those uh, died. And despite the low adult mortality, uh, like I said, they did have several uh, hundred uh, uh, chicks die. They're probably the, the chick deaths, at least for the Caspian terns, were probably a combination of avian flu. I'm sure they're, they're quite susceptible, but also some adults were going off and dying elsewhere. And so the, a lot of the chicks would just be abandoned. And so they would, they would, um, they would all, they would die from just being neglected and, and starving uh, in pretty short order because they have to be fed all the time when they're in that, uh, that chick growing phase. So although no other breeding colonies were confirmed in the Salish Sea, the, the, um, they did have documented um, mortalities in uh, four other locations in the Salish Sea. And this is uh, compiled by uh, WDFW colleagues. Uh, so in Bellingham and Everett and Bremerton and Tacoma, um, interestingly, not places that were documented breeding locations, um, but certainly um, locations where they have bred in the past. So some of these birds could have been prospecting birds or they might have bred their previous years, but they weren't breeding this year. So they could have been non-breeders, uh, but still um, those get figured into the estimated Pacific flyway mortality that um, WDFW put together. And so with uh, about 350 um, birds being counted down in the Columbia River, sort of the whole estuary, not necessarily at the island, um, more than, uh, 1,500 birds uh, were dead, probably of the of the locations. The flyaway estimate, depending on how people do them, is like 10 to 15,000 birds. So, this one event uh, is potentially responsible for uh, you know mortality of 10 to 14 percent of the of the Pacific flyaway population, which is which is quite remarkable. Um, and so, this latest may pose a problem for a Caspian tern population that is under gone a decline uh, over the last 20 years, um, both at East Sand Island. Here, the East Sand Island is shown in the black dots. So it was sort of um, chugging along. And then in 2008 is when management started. So so this was this represents sort of a decline, sort of a uh, redistribution of some of those birds outside of the Columbia River estuary. Um, but and, and so there's a greater proportion in other, some of these other additional colonies, but still the overall trend is still down from sort of a peak in 2008, 2009. Um, so it's, it's a problem even at the flyway level. So one of the things that I thought of was how, uh, what potential future work could try to track Salish Sea nesting attempts in a, in a more detailed fashion. Um, as full aerial surveys are only conducted every three years. Uh, the next one is scheduled for uh, next year, which is good. But as we know, intervening years can be quite eventful. Uh, the last three years saw, saw them ex experience a heat dome, predator-induced colony abandonment, and a global flu pandemic. So um, trying to potentially track the birds more often than every three years uh, could be quite important. 
So one tool that I thought we might use is eBird, where we can crowdsource almost in near real time where Caspian terns are being observed through the Salish Sea and elsewhere, particularly where they might be foraging and roosting in substantial numbers. So it might be possible to sort of dive down into data from, uh, from people, um, especially if uh, word can go out into the community that um, people are, uh, were especially interested in um, large groups of birds, birds where there, it looks like there is um, you know, mating activity going on, mate feeding activity going on, um, where there might be an incipient colony that is starting, or they might be using a colony that they haven't used for some years because of this kind of nomadic um, uh, tendency that they have. Um, and so this might be very, uh, this might be an untapped um, uh, set of uh, data where we might be able to um, get a handle on where birds might be congregating. So birders could be the eyes and ears of, of Caspian turn researchers and identify potential colony locations. Um, satellite imagery online might also be used to explore uh, potential breeding colonies. Um, while images are not always of high enough quality to verify nesting activity, they can, along with boots on the ground observation, um, such as eBird checklists and tweeter communications, um, they might help to glean where Caspian turns are congregating and potentially nesting. Um, um, high, very high def uh, satellite uh, imagery has been used to track um, some other species, uh, albatrosses in particular, so endangered albatrosses. Um, but you have to make appointments with the military and they are often not um, interested in helping out your, um, your, your quaint Seabird Conservation Project um, because they have important things to do with their satellites, but um, but even just the ones that are available on Google Earth. And so, for example, um, you can scroll through a series of images on Google Earth um, over time. And so um, that's what I did here for so for Rat Island, which is uh, here in the center. Um, you can look. I I I captured the same spot. You know, sort of where the um, colony has been over time um, during uh, particular years. So in 2015, um, although you don't see a lot, if you if you get even closer down, you can you can make down you can uh, make out bodies. It's it's sort of a it's a pretty small probably colony. And also because this was, um, but it was verified as having 525 nests by aerial surveys in 2015. Um, so it confirms, uh, this confirms that, um, you can't, you can't really tell necessarily because it isn't a wash with guano because, um, this, um, the satellite image was taken in May. So they hadn't been there sort of for the whole season in 2016. Um, there might be some sort of remnant guano patches from the previous year, but, um, they're, uh, they weren't known to breed on the Island in 2016. It doesn't look like they did. 2017, the same thing, no terns were known to nest on the island, um, but there weren't any surveys, but they were not known to have been here. So uh, the next survey was in 2018, and that did verify uh, that um, there were zero birds breeding on uh, Rat Island in 2018. So the aerial survey and the Google Earth imagery um, lineup. Um, in 2020, there, there were no reports uh, either of the nesting there. In 2021, the aerial survey um, said that there were zero birds nesting, and it certainly uh, looks that way on the Google Earth imagery. But in 2022, when there were 500 to 1,000 birds out there, you can see, and this is this is part of the trick, you know, when they use for albatrosses to count bodies, um, but you can see uh, penguin colonies from space as well, right? Where you can see these sort of guano halos. And so it also depends on, I didn't put the month of this, um, but it definitely confirms this, uh, the same thing as the aerial surveys, uh, sorry, not the aerial surveys, the on the ground surveys of, of uh, colleagues. Another thing that Caspian turn researchers could use uh, this information for is to identify potential locations for on-colony work. Um, I've done some of this in uh, the Potholes Reservoir. 
Um, so, and so to understand the trajectory, we might undertake dedicated observations from a blind of, of, their, of their reading activities or productivity and diet um, using observation blinds. This is a, a blind out here in the potholes on a, on a turn colony. There were also gulls there and this, this was two-way glass. And so um, we could sit in there, the birds couldn't see us, but we could see them. We could identify individuals coming back to nests um, and we could identify the fish that, that were coming back and then how many eggs they had during switch, the, their nest switches and chicks. And so we were right in the thick of the uh, colony and we had to climb up through a tunnel in order to get there so that they wouldn't see us. Um, and so you can sit and you can make these observations and you can see them coming back. Um, the turns are plunge divers in the top you know, meter or so of, of, of waters where they feed primarily on small fishes. And during the breeding season in particular, um, single captured prey items, they bring back one at a time, which again is very nice if you want to try to identify things. Um, they they aren't consumed immediately, but they're brought back to the colony to, uh, to be displayed to court potential mates early in the season, to feed mates um, um, when they're sitting on the nest. Or, uh, sitting on eggs or chicks, um, or to feed um, uh, their young. And so where the observations are possible, this can be crucial to identifying factors that might be um, influencing annual success, you know, in addition to colony disturbances or other things going on at the colony, or what their diet is composed of in the different places where they're, and if there's any connection between diet and breeding success. Uh, another thing that could be done, undertaken, is um, uh, colony-based banding and tracking studies, because you could illuminate sort of intercolony movements and connectivity, uh, foraging behavior, perhaps uh, where they're going if you use certain um, uh, kinds of tags and migration patterns. And then at locations where on-colony work may not be feasible, it may be possible to get on colonies after the breeding season concludes. So for example, this is um, Kirsty and I got on top of the US Coast Guard building where the birds were for a few weeks and they definitely laid a lot of eggs and they were bringing in tons of fish. And so I <clears throat> wanted to get an idea of uh, the fish that have been brought back and, and consumed by, the, by either the the bird that brought it back or, or, or the mate if they were doing uh, mate feeding. So Caspian terns regurgitate uh, pellets of indigestible material. So the bones represented their activity and reflected uh, in part what fish taxa that they have been consuming. So um, interestingly, uh, it was a dry summer, but also just very windy. And so these roof, these drains uh, which are for water, sort of accumulated um, the drains and the edges of the building, accumulated um, a lot of, the, you know, whatever was up there, egg, you know, shell fragments and bones. And, and, you know, and so uh, we scooped up um, with my little toy shovel and, and put into um, Ziploc bags um, samples from, uh, from eight, eight different of these uh, drains. And uh, this close up shows you, you know, if you, really look down in it, this is just replete with um, fish vertebrae and other bones. It's just, it's, it's an amazing stockpile of fish. And so just looking at some of the, looking at all of the samples, but just a small portion of the samples, because it's a little, it, it overwhelms my colleague who does this for a living. Um, but it did show that just in terms of, of the eight samples that we took, uh, anchovy herring, salmon, sticklebacks, and yellow perch, which is a, a freshwater species, which they must have gotten from Lake Union or Lake Washington, um, were in every single sample. And then shiner perch were in three of them, a cod of some sort uh, was in two, flatfish and sand lance were in two, and, and a smelt was in one. So um, it just gives it gives an idea of information that, that you can get and sort of more detailed examination may turn up uh, may alter these uh, data a little bit but it's 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 for sure that uh, that many of the species that are available are being taken by the turns 
And then, as I said, tagging and banding studies indicate that there's widespread movement of individuals among colonies. Um, satellite tagging of adults here, um, they tagged adults in out here in the potholes area um, in 2014 and 2015. So satellite tagged them in 2016 in sort of, you know, when the fish were, you know, the, when the salmon were out migrating, say in May, then they could get locations of where they were. And of course they were in and around, you know, where they had been tagged. They were adults. So they were probably uh, breeding there uh, or perhaps breeding there. I mean, they're spending most of their time there, but some were actually doing a fair amount of exploring going out to uh, East Sand Island in the mouth of the Columbia and then up into the Salish Sea. So even though it's a uh, uh, breeding season, if they were going to breed in the potholes, um, the fact that they were that far away, that's too far away for just a foraging trip. So they were probably prospecting other areas uh, to breed. And then color banding studies uh, um, have been uh, go ongoing for, for many years, uh, generally of chicks. Uh, but sometimes adults and so you know you can get some that are that that uh, have been banded in the potholes or in the in the estuary and they can be seen uh, here in Everett and and many have been seen um, many birds have been seen at Rat Island in the last couple of years by people that are um, by colleagues that are uh, working on observing the colony there and so um, you sh there's a lot of significant movement among almost all of the historical connected colonies so that's just another, that's just a set of, of, of studies that might be undertaken to sort of um, add to our knowledge of, of where Caspian terns are in the Salish Sea. Um, and it's not going to get easier for Caspian terns in the Salish Sea, uh, given the paucity of stable natural breeding habitat, um, the natural and anthropogenic disturbances that breeding colonies can experience, and the specter of diseases and other factors it might be exacerbated by rising global temperatures. Uh, the shipwrecked Odysseus barely escaped the clutches of Scylla and Charybdis by clinging to a tree until it was safe to return to the water. Um, and Caspian terns and the humans that can influence their survival and productivity may have to be equally improvisational to help them establish a consistent foothold in the Salish Sea. And so ideally, any human improvisation will be science-based and be adaptive uh, to a changing world. Thank you. Bravo, bravo. The problem with these, as you know, is you can't see all the smiling faces. <laughs> I can't. Well, if I, I can unshare if, uh, if no one's yeah, going to ask about a specific uh, slide. If the, yeah, you know, the 50, almost 60 people out there, any of you that want to turn on your cameras, turn on your videos as Zoom ins insists on saying it, we're very happy to see your smiling faces. I don't, I don't think applause works very well, but um, no, it's, it's, <laughs> there we uh, go. Uh, as people are doing that, I hope, uh, yeah, Dave's got his thumb up. I, I feel as if Gullboy here, yes. <laughs> Gullboy would happily happily acknowledge if he knew uh, that we have both Kirsty Mill and uh, Steve Hampton uh, in in attendance. I saw that. Gosh, their work uh, carries. Yep, good, good. Well, um, we have a nice okay, set of questions. If I may, I don't know, Tom, if you're if you're interested in peering through them, but I can get them to you. Okay. Uh, the first one was by Michael Scuderi. Did they track the shift of inland colonies via banding, radio telemetry, or other methods? This is in reference to that mention you made of a hundred years ago or less. They were uh, yeah. inland birds. I think, I think there was some banding uh, because it, um, there were some Oregon State University where, which talk about the center of gravity of, of research on this in the Pacific Northwest. Um, a few papers that had looked at sort of over the century. So they had looked at banding returns from the beginning of the 20th century. 
um, through the 20th century. Um, and there, so there was some, there was some banding activity, um, you know, U.S. Fish and Wildlife banding, um, maybe more so than uh, color banding, uh, you know, for short-term studies. Um, but I think uh, it was, some of it was that, and some of it was just, you know, people out, naturalists out, birders out documenting. It's like, oh, there's a colony that's set up here in the potholes or, um, and so, uh, and in fact, you know, in order to do that, you need to be out in the boat <laughs> in, in this water sort of navigating between these uh, uh, islands and things. And that's how people would long ago uh, would uh, figure out where some of these colonies were. Uh, so I think it was some banding, but a lot of just searching. And Tom, would you know, has that trend, migration sort of trend, been the case globally for Caspian terns? Uh, you as know, most I, of us hopefully know, the Caspian tern is a worldwide dispersed bird, except Antarctica or something. You're um, right. Um, it is, and I don't. I don't know. I mean, it's yeah. I'm. You know, there are obviously people that that. Um, that know a lot about them in Europe, and there's people that have worked on them in the Great Lakes, which experienced its own die-off, avian flu die-off in 2022. Um, and uh, it, I don't think they did in 2023, which is interesting in and of itself. Um, but um, so I don't know if there was sort of an inland to coastal tendency um, because there also was I didn't mention this as much for the for the Pacific Flyway. Um, there has e there has been sort of northward movement, like you know, it went coastal and then up into Washington. It's um, there are some you know a few colonies in BC, and there's you know a small colony or two in Alaska even. So there's been northward movement as as well, and it and it's all been coastal. It seems as if once they find the coast, they uh, stick to the coast. Well, that it is fascinating since Caspian turns have been around a long time. Yes. I'm, yeah. <laughs> you have to wonder if it's habitat encroachment, habitat encroachment inland or something like we do to everything else. <laughs> yeah. Let's see. Uh, uh, by the way, if any of you had not seen those lovely references that Tom showed on one of his slides, they are pasted into the chat with hyperlinks that you can click on. Um, Mike, Michael Scuderi also asked, could some modification of a true island, such as Protection Island, be created as suitable habitat for Caspian tern nesting in the Salish Sea? Yeah, I think... Um... Sometime, I think there, I think the, again, sort of the Oregon State folks had published a paper in 2012 that was sort of part of this uh, management strategy was also to look else, you know, to continue looking elsewhere. Well, where else might there be uh, possible to put? And so they, they went through a process of kind of scoring all of these islands, some of which, or locations, some of which had been, um, you know, breeding locations before some some that have not protection on this one of those ones that I don't think has been. Um, it doesn't have. Um, I will see them when I'm working out there on rhino auklets. Uh, we'll see them congregating on the beaches, but the be you know all, all that habitat disappears at high tide. Oh yeah, um, there's not also, much beach there. <laughs> there's not much beach there, and the places where it used to be sort of you know fairly low well i'm sure they used to mow it but um vegetation encroachment there has even um influenced the gulls that use that habitat down down low near the water there's a colony near the marina um and it seems like it's just getting smaller and smaller and they just are getting squeezed out of that vegetation because it just gets so thick they don't they don't like it too thick and they move to the edge of the water right around the marina so it's very dense there and so i i think you would you would have to you know denude that area of vegetation and um and keep it um, because succession is 
just comes along and the turns, they just really don't like anything, to, you know, blocking their view or, uh, you know, they, whereas the gulls will sidle up to a clump of educate, vegetation uh, and build a nest. The turns, they, they don't like it. They like to be able to see. Uh, I'm sure it's because they're, you know, of predators and things like that. The eagles also, there's like, you know, 20 to 30 eagles, you know, hanging out on Protection Island on any given day. So that that also makes it a tough call. Um, yeah. Yeah, so that's a tough one. Well, Mr. Gull, bringing us back to gulls, <laughs> that interesting set of uh, numbers you showed on the Rat Island uh, avian influenza deaths between the turns and the gull hybrids, would, would you suspect any reasons for why they were so much more susceptible, the turns? Uh, you know, I don't think we know enough um, necessarily. I mean, the, tur the, the you know, turns had a big die off, like I said, in the Great Lakes. I didn't hear about a gull die off there. Um, anyone who's, well, this is just my own, having spent a lot of time on gull colonies and with gulls uh, on the East Coast and the West Coast, um, anyone who sees what a gull will choke down won't be surprised uh -huh. that they have a very, uh, uh, their constitution is formidable. Um, and it's, you know, it's like, they, you know, they'll eat the most repulsive things and, you know, be fine. Things that you would think, oh, that, that, how does that not kill them? You know, they're much more scavenger like, you know, terns are definitely, they're piscivores. They, you know, they catch live fish. Um, and so, there may be something there, just that it's something. And in fact, it may be that the gulls, um, you know, uh, could, for all intents and purposes, you know, I don't know if they could be carriers. There hasn't been enough uh, testing of animals that aren't dead. Um, there's more of it happening sort mm -hmm. of, you know, nationwide or probably even globally just uh, to do um, testing, um, you know, monitoring that kind of testing, not testing everything that's dead just to see if it had um, avian influenza, but uh, test, you know, capturing birds and testing them and seeing, well, you know, what's, what's the sort of, um, you know, the, the sort of the latent um, percentage of birds that are out there that have it, but they seem fine. And so, um, I mean, that's the first suspicion I think that people have is that the gulls are just not as susceptible or they can carry it and be uh, okay, um, even though uh, that probably is just true for the adults because the chicks of both species seem to be fairly susceptible. And so, and that may just be because when you're a chick, right, you're just more susceptible to things. Thank you. I, I don't know if Kirsty Bull or Steve Hampton who are on this uh, Zoom meeting are have any questions uh, i mean sorry have any comments on that or any other we would welcome you to i think tom would welcome you to unmute and tell us oh, sure. um quest, question what is the world population of caspian turns any idea and is that also decreasing good question you know i don't know off the top of my head um but i think um i don't think they're having as many uh, again apart from or recent issues in the Great Lakes. Um, I don't know that the um, that they are having um, that things are as dire um, as they appear to be here in the Pacific Flyway. E e even in the U.S., the Pacific Flyway seems unique in uh, having more issues than sort of the Central or the or the Eastern Flyway. And then I I don't know about Europe. Um, so I, I don't want to speculate, but I, I haven't heard that their population is is uh, suffering from, you know, the thousand cuts that I was sort of speaking, alluding to. Um, uh, yeah. Well, Tom, we want to drag you a little bit more inland now with a few questions. Um, OK. <laughs> would, would, would Caspian terns return? to inland habitat to breed again or is that habitat no longer available tricky question yeah i think they i think they would i think that that was part of the attempt um i didn't show a map but the sort of you know the where they encouraged them to go 
um, as part of the management plan was basically lakes uh, in Oregon, inland lakes in Oregon, although they did also uh, San Francisco Bay, which is obviously a coastal site. And there are places in inland Washington, but of course, I mean, they're sort of on the no-go list in terms of, uh, because of the whole salmon problem, but there might be, but there might be places um, in inland Oregon, maybe even Idaho, you know, places that, again, part of those historical places, I don't know, you know, from place to place to place, if there are places that um, are just no longer tenable, like it wouldn't, you know, that it's just not possible because of changes that have occurred certainly places that it, if it's if it's just a matter of vegetation and you could reduce you know return something to a, a sandy island um, habitat I think they I think they would I think that it would it, it's certainly possible um, in the potholes the sort of goose island uh, is is not sand it's basically rocky but sort of this kind of soil that they can at least dig you know just just enough of a cup just to make a little bit of a cup to hold hold their eggs and it's kind of rocky it's a very anyone who's been out in eastern water you know it's sort of the sage um and very kind of hard scrabble kind of uh, habitat and and they do okay on or they did do okay on goose island but again it's sort of it's near the columbia and they were just they were they had a highway from the potholes, even though that was one of the interesting things we found was, sure, they ate a lot of bass and yellow perch and, you know, sort of alternative species. Um, but they would make the, I think it was like 30 kilometer, they would fly, they'd just go west <laughs> and they'd find the Columbia and they would find a salmon and they'd fly all the way back Um and one of the, you know, sorry. Yeah, so most of the time that when they were flying west to the Columbia, it was into the wind. And so maybe a little bit easier, but it's super windy out there. But by that, when they had a fish, they were coming back. So they were, you know, the wind was with them, but it still was remarkable. They would be gone for hours to get, you know, a salmon and bring it back. So once they found that, um, then they, yeah, they, they won't give that up. And so that's why, that's why they're sort of a, a second part of the management plan included um, the potholes and Crescent Island, which is right in the river. Um, so they won't be they won't be encouraged back to those two places. But perhaps it, you know small colonies in lakes, um, sort of peppered throughout uh, uh, the region. Tom, did you just say that they were expunged from the potholes region? Maybe I misheard that. Uh, one well, person had, wanted to know, one person wanted to know if they're still nesting there. They are. They are not. They are. They are sort of like they. They use active dissuasion. I guess they call it or passive. They use both, um, but mostly just put streamers <laughs> up to keep them away. So they're sort of. Um, they are. Uh, they are precluded from nesting uh, in the potholes. Now and there were there were three or four hundred pair there when I was studying them in the two thousand four two thousand five, mm -hmm. so yeah that's that's one of the locations that um, they're they're not welcome at. <clears throat> right, Uwe, uh One of our yeah. audience members believes uh, says that there is a uh, continuous breeding colony at Sprague Lake. And then ask uh, what threats there are to inland sites in less populated areas like Sprague Lake area. It's a pretty pretty unpopulated area. Yeah, where is Sprague Lake again? Yeah. <laughs> I up, don't it's know. Up night, it's up night. It's up the highway going to yeah. Uh, yeah, to it's. Remember. I think it's on ninety going going out towards Yakima or something. Oh, something okay. Like Spokane. Um, yeah. One. <laughs> Yeah, I don't, I mean, again, I don't think, uh, you know, short of, uh, um, yeah, when they do these aerial surveys, they do the whole Columbia River Basin. And so they do have, they do have documentation of, of some of these other colonies. And now that you mentioned the Sprague Lake, I think, um, again, short of, uh, you know, finding ways to uh, prey on salmonids, I don't think there's, there aren't, 
there aren't other reasons to preclude them from nesting in, in, in these inland areas. Um, so, but of course, uh, speaking from, you know, the marine fishes end of things. So if there may be freshwater species that are, um, that would be a problem uh, as well, but I'm not aware of them. One of our uh, audience uh, looked at BirdLife International. Thank you, Craig. And oh. it appears that Kate populations are increasing across the world. That's nice to know. Oh, yeah. and, you know, they're See? not going to be they're not going to they're not going to be threatened or endangered enough to be protected the way some uh, are. But um, does anyone know anything about artificial islands? Those might have some place. Yeah, some of some of the setups in the Oregon lakes were, I think, essentially, you know, kind of a barge like an artificial or they created an artificial island, you know, out of rock and sand and, you know, actually built an island. Um, the, the, the experiment in 2001 uh, in Commencement Bay was a barge and they uh, because these birds had been nesting on sand piles at that uh, super fun site. And so it was like, oh, well obviously not picky maybe this is a place we can encourage them to come and um and they again through the social attraction they got them to nest on the barges uh, i think they moved from the you know the pot sand piles uh they had been there for a couple of years to these barges and they started studying their diet and i think they were after about a month um they were alarmed at the <laughs> at the percentage of their diet that was salmon. And so um, oh. they said, oh, yeah, this is obviously not a, a good idea. You're, you're essentially attracting them to an area and then creating a problem where they um, where one might not exist. And so, um, you know, the, the Superfund site has since all been developed. So that that again, so things like that happen. And so there wasn't even a place for them to go anyway without that barge and so but that that experiment i mean that was actually cut short they said oh nope, this is a bad idea um uh -huh. we're not gonna we're not gonna do this but potentially in other places i mean especially in more marine the i think that the the lesson from that very first uh management action they did in 2000 or so is if you move birds from you know a, a location where a lot of the potential prey is salmon, then they're going to eat a lot of salmon. So further up river, they eat a lot of salmon. When they moved them to East Sand Island, um, they ought, they ate fewer, much fewer salmon. So if you could actually get them even more, um, you know, maybe, uh, and this would be hard to do, but if you could, if you could have islands that were set up that were really truly coastal so that they would be out in the near shore waters their potential prey is going to be a lot less salmon and a lot more of the marine forage fish that all, that all the seabirds are eating out there, the, the herring and anchovy and sand lance and smelt and things like that. That might have promise, but you know, how, you, how you logistically do that is probably difficult because of you know, our winters um, and things like that. Um, some of the islands that I was studying in Grays Harbor, when I was studying gulls there, you know, they, one of my, one of my islands that I was working on Wickham Flats um, basically disappeared <laughs> um, do, you know, in the intervening years, sort of, you know, winter storms and things. It just, it sort of, it, it got so eroded and sort of washed away that it had once been a, a very dominant island in Grays Harbor with, with cormorants and terns and gulls. And then it was gone in the middle of my study. Um, so the coast, the coastal habitat is, is rough. Ah, oh, um, thank you, Steve Hampton, who brought, uh, a little thought to us that turns worldwide do seem more likely to suffer mass mortality from avian flu than gulls. Oh. They do nest in more compact colonies. So that may be a factor. Yeah, that's true. 
that's true. They are, yeah, they are cheek to jowl in some of these colonies. Um, and I think that's what they're finding with some of the and other Steve, seabirds. Yeah. Steve has just uh, just asked something that I'm not sure I understand, but what about <laughs> social attraction at Smith off Whidbey? Would that result in mixed diet? Social attraction. Hmm. Oh, Smith and Minor Islands? Um, yeah, they they it seems like they have toyed with nesting there. Um, but again, it's sort of, a, you know, Having worked on the island on 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 rhino auklets and tufted puffins, there's lots of gulls there. There's lots of eagles there. <laughs> um, the cormorants probably are wouldn't be an issue, but um, but maybe again, you you know you'd have to make a concerted effort to change the habitat. I think to make it possible for for the terns. Um, I think they tried. They have tried intermittently. Um, and uh, again, sort of, you know, storm surges uh, or just, you know, uh, you know, the, the tides and winds and um, currents kind of creating, you know, this perfect storm kind of thing. And then it just they, they are too close to the water and they get washed because that's where the sandy habitat is. And then they get washed away. But that might that might be a possibility. I'm sorry, Tom, what what does social attraction mean putting out decoys yeah that's the yeah that's the decoys and and um right. uh sound yeah colony sounds to to pull oh, them okay. in thank you yeah making it seem like it's a great place to be. well <laughs> well i have to chuckle because the last question that we're going to pose to you is from bob and it's a gull question we're, we're going to leave the, the turns behind. Oh. He wrote, you label the Rat Island gulls as hybrid Western gull, <laughs> Western gull. Where do you stand on the glaucous wing gull, hybrid gull, Western gull taxonomy conundrum? Should they be lumped since they clearly produce viable offspring? Or shall we continue to say they're different? Da -da -da <laughs> uh, well, you know, I did say that that's a story for another time. But... Um, Oh, it disappeared. My chat disappeared. I was going to consult it for. Oh, there it is. Um, oh, just yeah. so, no, I, it came back. I just wanted to see where um, I was sort of looking at that as you uh, were reading it. Um, yes, I well, one, I should say, uh, I didn't label them as um, hybrid Western glaucous wing. Um, I did study them out in Grace Harbor and on Tatouche Island, and um, I, you know, I, I am not a um, taxonomy kind of person, or uh, uh, or and uh, or even that good at gull identification necessarily. But but as I was sitting, you know, like deciding who was what on these islands, you know, from 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 uh, studying, you know, their eye color and eye ring color and the color of their mantle and the wingtips and all this sort of stuff, the stuff that, that you would do to kind of assign something to a species or, or a hybrid, you know, there's so, there has been so much mixing over time um, that, you know, that's my default goal is, is like, well, it's, it's a hybrid or a hybrid back cross or a hybrid back cross, back cross, back cross, back. I mean, it's, it's it gets to the point where the, um, you need to be it at the two ends of each of the species um, ranges, I think, to, to really say that's a Western gull, um, or you, need, you know, you need to be in the, the um, lower 48, lower part of the lower 48 and glaucous wing gull, you know, obviously extends up into BC and Alaska. And it's like, oh, that's a glaucous wing. That's a pure glaucous wing gull, but um, they do interbreed and, um, and they do produce viable offspring, um, but they they seem to maintain their integrity. I don't know. I I'm not I'm not a fan of making these calls. I'm not one who makes these calls. Um, that's a tough one. Um, I wouldn't call it its own species. That's I will say that. Um, but um, they haven't. The hybrids haven't swamped out the. The, each of the species 
So it seems like they're maintaining their integrity, but people haven't looked at the genetics um, as much as they could as well. I, I was doing, you know, simple-minded ecological studies. Um, so I, I end up giving an ecologist's answer to a taxonomic question, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, that's a, a wonderful concept to uh, bring us towards the end. Are there any other questions anyone has? Fascinating and great treatment of one of our favorite birds. We're waiting for our first Caspian turn, maybe not the first to come by overhead and go, ha! Ah! Yeah, yes. <laughs> I'm always listening for that in the spring. Um, Absolutely, yes. Well, Tom, it is my pleasure to thank you on oh, behalf sure. of your audience and, and the audience of the future who will be in, able to enjoy the recording uh, down the line. We really appreciate all your efforts and expertise. Um, oh. If there's anything else you'd like to add, otherwise we'll let no. you go. No, just to, yeah, just to thank everybody. That, uh, um, it's been fun. There's certainly, yeah, certainly much more that can be done and learned. So that's um, the Caspian, the turn chasing will continue.